Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we have a very special guest, and I'm so excited to introduce him. He has been on the scene for 50 years and has worked with many greats from Gary Thomas, Cyrus Chestnut, Sunra, and yes, even Horace Silver. He is a drummer, composer, and educator. Please welcome to Jazz Talk, Mr. William Goffigan. Welcome, sir. Thank you. I'm honored and pleasure, Preston. Man, it's so good. It's so good to it's so good to have you on. You know, thanks for joining me. You know, William, uh, like I said, you've been on the scene, man, for uh, quite a while and have worked with many uh, jazz greats, as I've mentioned. But I'm curious to know a little bit more about you and your background, your humble beginnings. I understand that you are from Baltimore, Maryland. Yes. I was okay. Like, I was born in Virginia, but uh, Baltimore has been home for many years since the late 60s. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Well, tell us about your upbringing, man, how you got involved in music. I understand that you're uh, self-taught as far as drumming is concerned. All right, yes. Well, initially, as a new teenager, I was in the junior or the middle school marching in concert bands. Okay. And from there, I was self-taught on the hand drums, initially on the kungas. I have relatives in New York and Manhattan. Mm -hmm. I was staying with my aunts during the summer, and one of my neighbors was Pucho of Pucho and the Latin Soul Brothers Prestige Recording Arts. Okay. Uh, he used to play up the corner a hideout bar on 8th Avenue, and he invited me and some of the other neighbors in the community to come to the Morningside Park, and they used to have jams on Saturday sometimes. And I shared with them that, you know, I was interested in percussion. So he invited me to come and play and they taught me how to play the conga drum. So that's where I officially learned how to play the hand drums was in New York. Wow. <laughs> and uh, that was quite an experience to say the least. And mm -hmm. of course, Pucho just kept performing and recording. Uh, but after that, I also went to uh, high school down south at Book T. Washington in, in Norfolk. Mm. Um, I was in the marching and concert band there. And after having learned to play the hand drums, I wanted to expand and play the drum set. I could play the con concert, uh, you know, the marching drum and that kind of thing, because we played for the football team on the ball. And that was a great experience in addition. So I initially started playing the set. I had no drum set. I would have a, a just the seat of the chair was the snare drum and the back of the chair was my cymbal. <laughs> <laughs> a great imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure, man. <laughs> so getting a set and, uh, you know, of course, I just kept going and going. I remember my neighbors telling me, man, we could leave you playing in that attic, man. You'd be practicing all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I was really motivated by hearing great musicians. And I started listening to jazz as a mm -hmm. teenager and also Latin music. Mm -hmm. New York during the summer. So that motivated me to just continue to learn more about the music and, and the music scene. Yeah. Um, one of my first experiences was as a, a high school student. During those days, the, the bands would travel around just to keep active. They would take gigs in a variety of settings. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bart Price had his big band to come to our high school and play in the gym. And I wanted to sit in because, you know, it was an opportunity to play. So I asked the guys that I sit in. And my first official uh gig sitting in with somebody of note was with Lloyd Price's big band. Mm. And so I was, you know, just a youngster and that really kind of motivated me to continue. Um, I was a musician in the Musicians Association as a teenager also. The guys encouraged me, man, you're going to have to join me and you can't keep coming and sitting in with us <laughs> you're not in the union. Right, right. So right. they motivated me to join the union. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm just nurturing all the way in, during my development. Now, I wanted to ask you, uh, Mr. Goffigan, you also attended uh, Antioch College in Baltimore? Yes. Oh, yes, indeed, Preston. I was here in town 
uh, when it was on the east side back in the day, and it then became later on, it became Sojourner and Douglas. But right. during that time, it was Antioch College, and I was a major in music practice. Now, you, stu you studied piano also, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Famous and notable James Hallman graduated of Morgan University. Wow. And he and his wife taught students privately. So I studied with him for about a year of uh, music theory and, and piano. Uh, so okay. that, uh, you know, helped me out to get a better understanding of the, you know, melodies and so forth. So that was a great experience. But I've been blessed to have um, had a group over the years as well. Yeah. I've been playing with a lot of great musicians. Yeah. So I don't I don't know. The other thing is a lot of times I'll share with people and they say, oh man, you're a great jazz player. I said, well, I consider myself a musician because I've actually played a lot in, in the rhythm and blues and popular music field as well. Mm -hmm. uh, years back I recorded with Gary U.S. Bonds, who did a quarter to three, and that's where I initially learn about being in the recording studio in that setting yeah i was always paying attention to what was going on so I, I got my education by being in the studio wow wow you know one of the things that one of the things that i'm curious to know i guess you know you're out and about you're playing man how in the world did you hook up with horace silver I, I was so impressed by that you know because horace is, is one of the greats but you know i saw that footage that you uh were with horace uh the late bob berg i believe uh tom harrell yeah, uh, 1974, Italy. How did you hook up with Horace? Well, this is a great story. There's a famous bass player now uh, who lives in California from Philadelphia. His name is Alfonso Johnson. And oh, I know Alfonso Clark. very well. Yeah. yeah. He used to be with Weather Report. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, he actually lived in Baltimore for a few years. And uh, he and I were in the studio together. We worked with Renault and the Junction. Uh, doing some contemporary music during that time. And so he and I became very good friends. Uh, he got me my early gig in, in Philadelphia because he's from Philly. Mm -hmm. and so I would go to visit him and he took me around on the music scene. And he was the person that recommended me to go to Europe to play with the gasoline band. Initially, it was going to be Joe Chambers, the famous drummer from yeah. New York. And yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe's been on the show too. I had Joe on about a month or so ago. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. A great Joe. Yeah. And so um, he didn't want to leave New York because he had a lot of recording sessions happening. So he opted not to take the gig. And as a result, they needed a drummer. So my friend Alfonso recommended me you up with the gasoline band. And that, that was a golden opportunity and a life change as well, Preston. Mm. So I did that and lived in Europe for a while. And upon returning, um, I knew a lot of musicians from New York. Mm -hmm. And one of them was with Par Silly, Alvin McQueen, the drummer. Oh, I know Alvin very well. Yeah. Great play, another great music. Man, I knew all the great drummers. All these guys could play, man, you know. So. Yeah interested in, in being in good company and, you know, just having that type of uh, camaraderie with great musicians. And so he was in town. They had played the Left Bank Jazz Society. And Alan says, man, I've been on tour for a long time. So he actually had come by my apartment when I was living in West Baltimore during that time after the concert. And he and I were talking and he shared with me that, you know, man, I've been with Horace on tour for 10 years. And he says, he showed me a satchel full of medication that he had. He had to take vitamins and minerals and all this stuff. He said, I'm not eating as proper as I want to. He says, I got to take a break from the road, you know, try to improve my health. So he asked me, he said, have you recorded anything? And during that time, I had recorded with uh, a keyboard player from D.C. named Hilton Self, a uh, student at Howard University. And so he said, let me hear what you got. So I played the recording for him. And he says, I'm going to leave the tour from Baltimore. He said, I'm going to recommend you to Harvard. Mm. I'm, I'm just going to, you know, take a break. And that's how I got to be with Harvard. Wow. That's incredible, man. Yes, it, it is. 
William, what was it like working with him, man? Because, you know, like by that time, you know, of course, he did some masterpiece recordings in the 60s, you know, like Song for My Father, Kate Verde and Blues, uh, the Jody Grind. I mean, and plus, you know, going back further, he was, uh, you know, I think he recorded some early stuff, you know, with Miles back in the 50s and some other greats. But what was it like working with Horace and what did you learn from him? Um, Horace was a great performer and a great human being as well. What I learned from him, I uh, recall that he and another musician I worked with, uh, Frank Foster, but Par Silver told me when he wasn't going to be on tour, he was going to get with another person to study some more. I said, you going to study some more? I mean, he has been with Blue Note Records for like 25 years or so. And yeah. He said he was going to learn some more. That really opened my mind up to knowing that it's it's infinite, it's endless on the amount of knowledge you need as a musician, and you have to be open and receptive to new concepts and ideas. Uh, you know, just stay open to continue to grow and learn. And that's one mm. of the main things I learned from Horace. The other thing is, he played faster than any other musician I ever played with. I mean, <laughs> the tempos were outrageous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you were, you were able to keep up, man. You were keeping time, you know? Well, thank you, thank you. It was an honor and a pleasure to have him work with Horace, and he was easy to work for as well. Yeah. And for the, that gig we did, we did maybe a one rehearsal in New York for maybe an hour, an hour and a half at the most, and then we went to Europe. We went on tour. So all the tunes that we played, I hadn't rehearsed, but I was familiar with Hard Silver's music because I had them in my collection. So I knew all the tunes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, you know. And like you said, you know, you just mentioned Blue Note. I mean, he, I think along with Art Blakey, were probably two of the biggest artists on Blue Note. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, the, out, the, out, the output from both of them I mean, is just, you know, huge. Uh, I'm also interested, you know, in uh, how you got to work with Sandra, man. I mean, wow, playing with that cat, you know. <laughs> there's, there's another great experience that I uh, have worked with Sandra. Uh, initially, um, my, I had my wife, my late wife, Jennifer Gothigan, um, had told me about Sandra during the time I was on tour with Horace. So when mm. I got back, she was telling me about another great pianist. You got to see this guy. You know, they have costumes and everything. And so she had actually seen Sun Ra perform in concert. And I had never seen him play live. So the next time he came back to town, um, he was at Walbrook High School. So I saw him there. I got a chance to meet some of the musicians. But at that time, I didn't play with him. I just was enjoying the music. Yeah. So, when he came to Left Bank Jazz Society, um, I got a chance to have a dialogue with him. And I, you know, he, he and I just kind of hit it off. So it was at Left Bank, I, I recall setting in with him first. Yeah. Left Bank Jazz Society did because he invited me to part of the orchestra. And that was just an electrifying experience as well. Sun Ra, for me, was the most unique musician. I mean, he, and he was a walking dictionary, actually. He, he was so well versed on a variety of things. I remember when we had come back from Toronto, Canada, we played upstate in New York at, at the university. And after the concert, a lot of people would come to the dressing room and want to have a chance to meet and talk with Sun Ra. And he would ask them, well, what's your name? And when they would share their name with him, he would say, oh, your ancestor or your lineage is so-and-so based on their name, just their name. I mean, he, he had so much information. He, and he did, he did that for like 10 people with different names, told them where they, where they came from and all of that. And I was just fascinated about Sun Ra's knowledge. And he also uh, talked a lot about Fletcher Henderson Big man. Sure, yeah. Fletcher Henderson was, was big in the music back in the day because he was doing radio. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, we talk about all these great musicians and this concept. Actually, Sun Ra had his music written. A lot of people thought they would just get together and jam. I rehearsed at the house, they had sheet music. <laughs> <laughs> so I found that unique as well. So I was, you know, just fascinated just by being in Sun Ra's presence. I had the chance to uh, 
take them to the supermarket while I stayed at the house with the guys. And they, and they actually made me part of the family. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that, his music was just something. I mean, if you even go back and listen to his stuff from the, the 60s and even late 50s, I mean, you think of the term avant-garde. I mean, he really was out there, but uh, just a brilliant, brilliant cat. I've heard yeah. so many wonderful stories uh, uh, about him. Now, in regard to your drumming, um, Mr. Goffigan, who were some of your major influences on the instrument? Major influences, uh, I will start with Art Blakey because he actually played my drum set five different times when he would come to Baltimore. Wow. Bring his kit, he would use my set. And um, I was just fascinated by the way he played. He just swung hard, but he had those Afro Cuban patterns going, you know, in the background. Sometimes he would do something uh, mm -hmm. very musical against the melody. You know, he just had some unique things going on with the percussions. I was always fascinated by that. Elvin yeah. Jones, um, uh, I like uh, Billy Cobham. I mean, all the guys, Tony Williams. I even I listened to uh, Shelly Mann from California. Yeah. Joe Jones and on Jimmy Cobb, you know, on and on. All the guys that really were playing, you know, I was very much in tune to what they were doing. Yeah. Interestingly enough, I had the opportunity to sub for Billy Cobb when when he played with um, Keita Betts, the late great bassist. Oh yeah, Keita yeah, Keita Betts, yeah. yeah. With, with Ella Fitzgerald, and also my teacher Freddie Wake played with Ella Fitzgerald too, the percussionist. Recorded. Yeah. He recorded with uh, McCoy. He recorded Lee Morgan and others. He's on that documentary film that uh, Lee Morgan's wife did. I, I call him Morgan. Yes, right. Yeah, that's Freddie yeah. Waits on drums in that. Yeah, yeah that's a so, great um, documentary, man. I, I saw that too, the fantastic documentary. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so um, I also sub for Jimmy Cobb and um, really? Billy Joe Jones also. Oh, uh, wow. With, with Gary Botts here and in town when Philly Joe was scheduled to come and do a gig. And he couldn't make it. Yeah. So uh, I subbed for him and I subbed for um, a couple of guys that are very notable in the industry. Um, one of them is uh, played with Herbie Hancock, Headhunter. Oh, wow. Uh, from DC. Oh, oh man, I got to call his name. Oh, I can't be this. I got to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Oh uh, man, Billy Hart. Oh yeah, great drummer. A fantastic drummer, yes indeed. Yeah. So I got I saw from him on occasion to play with Frank Foster going to the Club Med uh, in French West Indies. So I've been knowing a lot of great musicians over time and having great relationships with these guys. Yeah. Uh, I can share a story about here, the homegrown musician Cyrus Chestnut was in my band for three years here. I was about to ask you about that, man. You hooked up with these uh, two Baltimore greats, uh, Cyrus Chestnut and Gary Thomas. How did you uh, get together with these guys, man? Because both of them are just, especially Cyrus, whoo, you know? I, I heard Cyrus on a gig playing at the Haven, and I met him, and we got a chance to converse, and I was sharing with him. I had a group, and I was interested in playing with him. So, and and I, at some point, which is I do uh, contract commitments verbally, so there's no anything in writing. I would maybe ask you, well, would you like to do a recording date with me in the future? And I would leave it at that, and we shake hands, and that would be the commitment. Hey, you know what that says about you? That that means your word is good. Yeah, you know what yeah. I mean. A lot of a lot of people can't so, say that, but uh, you guys put out a recording. Uh, I remember back in two thousand seven, Eternal Flame, I believe. Uh, yes, we did. But the first one is this product right here. Ah. Titled Williams Lullaby. This was the Cyrus Chestnut first recording with anyone. Oh we, wow! Uh, we did this in New York with uh, Gary Box on alto saxophone. Wow. Asking to the old friend of mine from, from way back. And, uh, and Cyrus on keyboard. Yeah. 
And we recorded that in Twilight Studio in Manhattan. So, oh man, what a date. We had a great time. Wow. And Kitten Gaskins is a musician who I've been knowing over the years. He and I have uh, met on both sides of the pond here in the States and in Europe. Um, the first time we were in the same recording studio in London, England, and he was with Chico Hamilton, the famous oh, wow. And I was with the Gasoline Band, uh, you know, we formulated uh, from uh, musicians from the Army and Air Force Bands here, you know, from the States. They stayed over in Europe and formulated a 10 piece group. And the sound was like Chicago or 10 year drive. These guys were very dedicated. And, uh, you know, just the music was fantastic. Victor was over with Chico and we recorded in the same studio. Mm. And the second time I saw him in Europe, and I was over on a different occasion, he was playing at Ronnie Scott's club with Rasan and Roland Kirk. So I had to, oh, wow. to, to, to go by a visit and, and hang out with the guys. So he said, oh yeah, man, it's my cousin, man. He, he's with us. So, you know, they, I was admitted to the club. Yeah. And, you know, just got a chance to really enjoy the guy. Yeah, yeah. How'd you uh, hook up with uh, Gary Thomas? Thomas was in the band also for at least a couple of years. Okay. Um, and we and I had known each other for a period of time. So same thing, I asked him about recording. I said, man, I'd love to see you in the studio. We shook hands and a few years later, it all came into fruition. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah, Gary, Gary's a great player, man. Oh, great absolutely. Player. Yeah. So he, I was blessed to have the guys in, in the band before we actually had gone in the studio. So we played together and the chemistry was just so fantastic. I could determine at that time, I said, you know, this would be awesome if I could record this guy. Yeah. So it just worked out. I just thank the good Lord for that. That's fantastic. Now, uh, Mr. Goffigan, you're also an educator too, man. Now, is it is it Towson or one of those schools where you're teaching? Or you're on the uh, faculty? I'm, I'm Towson University and Goucher College has been at both locations for 40 years. And going on, well, COVID knocked me out of the box with uh, Goucher <laughs> this semester, but I'm, I'm actually working this year at Towson a couple of days a week. Man, so, that's fantastic. Uh, wow. As, as hey, I, I, I was going to ask you something. Uh, you know, because of COVID, of course, a lot of musicians are not touring right now. Are you one that teaches or has uh, courses online or working with students? That's a great question, Preston, but currently I'm not doing that. I've been kind of working on a home renovation project, which is keeping me hopping. Yeah. That might be something I would consider for future reference, but reference. Yeah. <laughs> I have a, a going yeah. joke with my sweetie about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, man, well, you know, your your knowledge and your background and all these greats that you've worked with, it'd be a privilege and an honor to sit under you and, uh, you know, share that with students, you know, because there's a lot of musicians I've had on, uh, Billy Cobham, and others, uh, you know, a guitarist Mike Stern and a lot of them are uh, teaching courses online. Chick Corea is doing a lot of that stuff too. Um, so yeah, it, it would be an honor for uh, for students to work with you. I'm just curious, when you're at home, uh, Mr. Goffikin, uh, what do you usually like to do as far as music is concerned? What artists do you listen to if you're just home chilling, relaxing with your, you know, with your wife? What what, what do you uh, what do you like to listen to? Um. I still like a broad variety. Actually, I listen to a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, plus, I enjoy Herbie Hancock. I got Stevie Wonder in the mix, and you know, just a variety of musicians. Yeah, you like you like bands yeah. like Parliament Funkadelic and Earth, Wind, and Fire. I don't have any Earth, Wind, and Fire, but I did uh, listen to them extensively. Yeah. A lot of years, but I don't have actually. That's interesting. I have to make sure I incorporate having some of those, uh, you know, compositions in my library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's when the fire is great. Yeah, I, uh, I interviewed uh, the leader of the band many years ago, Maurice White. Uh, guy was a genius. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, we just talked a lot about just uh, one of the guys that influenced him, uh, the great Charles Stepney Ranger. Uh, who was uh, sort of around the same time as Quincy Jones, but uh, he was one that discovered Minnie Ripperton. And oh, right. uh, yeah, yeah, he was uh, just a fantastic, brilliant, brilliant cat. Now, um, 
Now, of course, you know, you're 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 still in Baltimore right now, right? Yes. Now, you know, a, a nice place for you to perform if you haven't performed there, I would love to see you is Keystone Corner, man. That's the spot. All right. Well, you have to put in a great word for me. I, I will. I know the owner, Todd, very, very well. And uh, he's had some greats come through there. As I said, I caught uh, Jimmy Cobb, beginning of the year. Uh, Roy Haynes, 95 years old, still going. Roy was there. He said, Ron Carter, so many greats. And I said, you know what? That seems to be a good spot for jazz musicians. Because, of course, you, yeah. have Kate, you have Kate and Castle and Andy Music. But, yeah, uh, that, that, that would be a real nice place for you to perform Keystone Corner. You know? Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. So uh, are you working on anything right now, maybe putting together, uh, you know, some compositions or songs maybe for another uh, upcoming uh, recording? That's a great question as well. Actually, I am Preston. Um, okay. I've actually talked to a few musicians that I would love to record going forward. Uh, some great players from here in town as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking to do a, another session. And... I have some originals that I'm still writing music for. I keep being blessed to come up with these great tunes. I just thank the Lord for that. Yes, yes, Not sir. Not better at all. He just drops it down on me. But that's how <laughs> you know, uh, very, very good friend of mine, I'm sure you know, pianist uh, local in Baltimore, who I'd love to see you work with is uh, Lafayette Gilcrest. Actually, he's one of the persons I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Lafayette's I, I, a very good friend of mine because he plays him. a lot with David Murray. Oh, right. Yes. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I so, love Lafayette's sound and his, his approach to the music as well. Yeah. Um, I was playing percussion on a gig that we were doing uh, to dedicate to the late, great Rick Williams. Um, he was in a nursing home at the time. Uh -huh. so I wanted to do something to cheer him up. And he meant to play for him. And that was coordinated by Bobby Thomas, you know, from Baltimore also. Uh -huh. We had a great time. So Lafayette was on the keyboard. You know? oh, wow. Something, I was playing the hand drums and I made a little sound. He said, he looked over, he said, everything. I, all right, I said, man, yeah, I was just enjoying what you was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, said, uh, if, he's a, if, if he's a fantastic. He's a comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a fantastic talent, man. Yes, I like I said, I've known him for over 30 years. And I remember when he uh you know was starting out and uh he just he was the one that schooled me, you know, on Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, Bud Powell, McCoy Tyner, all of these cats. So yeah, Lafayette's uh, a great, great talent. Now, uh, also I was gonna ask you, have you ever done anything with film before? You know, like film scores or gotten involved in anything like that, written oh, anything? Yes, I did um, a few films. Actually, I did one with Sun Ra, and that's called um, the album was on the other side of the sun. Okay. The and I think the concert was uh, a joyful noise that was recorded at Left Bank Jazz Society. Wow. And then, of course, the thing I did in the with Hard Silver. Yeah. Um, but there's another recording that I've done in addition. And I'm trying to give you some information about that. Oh, I think some 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 additional ones that they recorded at Left Bank that I wasn't aware of. Oh wow. I think I'm on play with the Chet Baker at Left Bank years back also. Oh wow. Man, Chet Baker. Wow, that's uh Another great uh, horn player. Yeah, yeah, he was uh, he was nice for playing ballads uh, to Chet's thing. Uh, yeah, playing ballads. Uh, any musicians that, uh, or let's just say any gigs that you turned down that you wish you hadn't, or did you have like some opportunities to play with some artists and you're like, man, I wish I hadn't, you know, passed that up? Um, there was one I did consider that I could have possibly done with, with um, Columbia, Columbia record recording artist that recorded Misty Earl Garner. He played at Left Bank Jazz Society. Oh man! And he did drums and I wouldn't do it. Why? <laughs> the, um, the financial arrangement wasn't quite up to par. <laughs> I got you. I, <laughs> I got you, man. I got you. Hey, that that makes sense. That but makes there, sense. There was a situation that I played at Left Bank for one set. Um, the, the drummer was. 
had the problems with transportation from the train coming down to mm -hmm. the start, and that was with Randy Weston. Oh man, Randy that, Weston. Randy and, and left bank. Yeah. And uh, that was awesome as well. Yeah. And I have a fear the left thing with two people. Frank Foster, the Frank Foster's another bad cat. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now that's a person that someone had some footage on, as well as the, the session that we did in New York at the Twilight Recording Studio. Somebody came in with some equipment. Somebody got man, you gotta hear this. The next thing you know, there was a guy showing up at the recording session and I didn't get his information. So that's you know, I don't know where that got promoted. Could be maybe in Europe or somewhere like that. Yeah. But, um, you know, that was one. I just wanted a copy of it, man, because the Cyrus and, and Gary, the boss, Cyrus Chestnut and Victor Gaston, man, you know I would have loved to have had a copy of that. <laughs> oh, man, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Wow, that's great. You know, it's interesting. A lot of these uh, people, that we're talking about. Of course, I've had Cyrus on the show. He was just on maybe like a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, some of these other local musicians uh, in Baltimore, so much great talent out there. You know, I'm looking at a lot of these, because, you know, we think it's jazz in good hands, because, you know, a lot of the the Herbie Hancocks, the McCoy Tyners, the, the Wayne Shorters, of course, those guys are still, you know, um, making good music. And of course we lost McCoy this year, but you know, you stop and think is jazz in good hands. And I think it is. I think a lot of these young players, they get it. And uh, Dizzy Gillespie said it best. You have to have one foot in the past and one in the future. Yes. You know? And uh, you know, the music will be in good hands, but listen, man, I want to thank you so much for being on jazz talk today. It's been a pleasure and an honor chatting with you. Uh, you're a treasure and I hope to see you, man. Once this uh, coronavirus is over or it's better, I hope to see you at Keystone Corner. So I'll have to, I'll have to talk to Todd about this. Oh, thank okay. you, Justin. It's an honor hey. and a pleasure to be a part of this show. Hey, sure, sure. Hey, hang on. I'm about to close out the show. All right. You've heard it from William Goffigan. And as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. <laughs>